Hey family, what's going on? This is Binu. I just want to take this time to thank you for joining us online uh, for our Sunday service this morning. Um, God has some great things planned for us today. Um, we are going to have an awesome time in worship and a message afterwards. Hope you guys are blessed. I know it sucks not being together, worshiping and praising together, but uh, soon enough we'll be together. Hey family, um, if you haven't done so, Please share this with anyone who needs uh, Jesus in their lives. Um, we all know we need Jesus more than ever. Uh, and also, hey, thank you again for joining us. Um, I love you. I miss you. I can't wait to worship with you again. Hey, enjoy the service. I'll see you soon. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel. We are so glad to see you today. You are in for an awesome service. Before we get to that, though, let me just remind you that next week is Easter. Join us online for our Easter services or register to be on the waiting list for seats for the live services on Sunday morning. And don't forget that on Wednesday, we have our final Zoom prayer meeting of this month. So join us for that. We're going to be doing corporate prayer together on Zoom. Today you're in for a great lesson from Pastor Trey, and he's going to finish up the series on habituals, and you're going to be just astounded with his object lesson and everything he does. We thank you for joining us. Have a good service.
Karen. And I'm Al Andrews. We've been at Bethel for 26 years, and I serve in B Kids. When I met Al, I was a single mom, and I, I always gave to the church, even when it was really hard, and God always provided. Early in our marriage, we decided we would continue returning the love and mercy God has showed us. Through tough times and good times, we gave regularly, and God always blessed us. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We invite you to give generously also because God is generous. Lord, as we give our offerings, may it be a sign of our love for you. Amen. All right, guys, I, I have Amy with me. We give her a round of applause. So Amy, we know that, that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes. What brings you to this place today? Why, why are you going public with your faith? Um, I guess just because it's been years of going through different things. Um, I'm a cancer survivor. So I started coming here. Daisy, <laughs> Daisy's brother's wife actually invited me in 2014. Awesome. So, Ever since then, I've gone through some other troubles, lost uh, immigration issues. Pastor Rob has blessed my mother's ashes. Um, but I feel like I was baptized as a Catholic as a child, but that's not really our decision. So I feel like now is being grown and like I know I'm a father of Jesus that I feel like this is my time to do it for myself. So, and I'm just part of so much with Bethel and I'm just so blessed to have so much go on, and since I've started just believing after being sick, so many good things have been happening, even though we have so many bad things going on in the that's world. That's right, that's right, that's right. God is good, he's got a plan for your life. Yes. This is your decision to go public with your faith today. So let's thank yes. God for it. God, thank you for Amy. Uh, thank you for her story, God, uh, from the brokenness, to the pain, to the struggle, to the disease, to now healing in Jesus' name, to being a victor and a survivor, God, for the women and men and families that you've surrounded her with that support her and encourage her and give her hope. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, or hey y'all, how y'all doing? There are people in the room, and um, if this is your first time being in the room with us, man, have I missed you. Uh, it, ha it has been a task, but this is what I would know through all of this. God has been faithful. God has kept us. God has not forgotten us. And what God has for us is still so much more. One of the things I, I want to say is, you know, I know we're in this series called Habituals. We're asking, are we forming spiritual habits and, or are we just performing spiritual rituals? And, and here's the thing. One of the things I've said quite a few times that other pastors have said is that God is not confounded to a building. God is bigger than a building. God is, is bigger than a worship service. God is bigger than any of that. So I have to give a balance, though, because when you hear me say that, you may assume I'm saying, so the building don't matter. I'm just saying the building don't matter as much as who God is. But this is what I do know. There's a blessing in the building. Here's what I, I do know. There's a blessing in the services. So like, so we're in COVID right now and, and, and we have some rules and stuff. And so somebody who's in this room right now, uh, I guess they hadn't seen me in a while and they ran up on me and they hugged me. And I was like, coronavirus. <laughs> but, but, but let, let me show you something because, because in that moment, you know, in the Bible, 
scripture talks about Jesus healing a leper. And it says that Jesus touched the leper. And can I say in that moment, I completely understood Jesus and that leper. But maybe not the way you think. See, here's what I know. If I can be completely honest with everyone, you at home, you in the room. This has been one of the most challenging weeks of my life. Hands down. It started on Sunday and it just came in wave after wave after wave. So what I thought is if I could just get to the platform and preach. Because you know what? Up here, th- this, is my, this is my safe space. Like I got this. This right here is where I'm comfortable. So if I could just get to the platform, then I could be healed. The leper went to Jesus and thought all they needed was to be healed. And the scripture says that Jesus touched them. And Jesus didn't just heal them. Jesus made them whole. See, what happened was people would say, ooh, they dirty. Stay away from them. Uh, uh. And Jesus said, I'm going to break the rules. Not to just get you healed, but I'm going to make sure you're whole. That person don't know how much I needed that. That before I could even get up here on this platform, they were Jesus and I felt like the leper and they came to make me whole. God used them. See, this is why we're pushing so hard to get back in this building. This is why we're pushing so hard to get back in this room. This is why we're pushing so hard to get back into community to with each other because guess what? A sermon is good and you can be healed, but guess what? Community is where we find our wholeness. God works in and through people. And I just want to stand up here and say, some of these people are in the room right now, that God used you in an amazing way this week. And you'll never know. In the same way that God could use you to help me, God wants to use you to help so many other people. See, it's not just about having an Easter service. It's not just about getting folks in the room for Easter so we can say we did something. We believe that what happens in here sets a platform and a stage for God to do something not just out there, but in the hearts of those in here. And God works in and through people. And guess what, Bethel? God wants to work in and through you. So, as the devil can see my shirt, (coughs) not today, Satan. Not tomorrow, Satan. I'm still going to do what God has called me to do, which is why I want to jump into my scripture as I continue our series on habituals. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 4. And it reads this way. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha? Asked, Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all, except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more. And he told her, and then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. God, I come to you right now. God, I ask that you would guard my heart, guard my tongue. Holy Spirit, in this moment, you have your way. You do what you want to do. You lead, I'll follow. I'm relying totally on you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Everyone agrees. Said, amen. 
Uh, so uh, we are coming out of COVID, kind of, sort of. And, and one of the things that I have missed the most is eating out. Y'all like, yeah, I knew you like to eat. Man, forget you. I hear you. <laughs> but, but that's one of the things. Like, you know, my family, we would, we would travel quite a bit. And, and so we always want to find new restaurants, date nights with my wife and I. Let's find a place we've never gone. May even hate everything on the menu. But, but we said we got an experience. Like, that is the funnest. But one of the people I enjoy eating out the most with right now is my son, Jordan. Jordan's up there. I'm looking at him right now because here's what I've learned about Jordan. Jordan is seven and Jordan has found out about a thing in a restaurant called a refill. Okay, so what Jordan knows is and his, he gets it from his dad. Okay, he, is that's just what we do. We enjoy uh, sweet, sugary drinks. And the Lord is working on me to take that away from me. Hallelujah. But one of the first questions he asks when he goes into a restaurant is he looks, he says, what can I get to drink? And are there free refills? <laughs> now, now, here's the thing about Jordan, though. Sometimes, I mean, he's seven. So, some, I mean, he's not a finicky eater. The boy, he, he'll eat anything. But sometimes he will overeat. And he will not touch the soda. And me as a dad, I hit that edge where I'm like, boy, I paid for that. You better drink that and you better get that refill. <laughs> and so what will happen, though, is Jordan may just like drink a little bit of it down. And he'll say, well, why don't they come and refill my cup? I'm like, well, well Jordan, if you haven't drunk what you have. But there's space. And I said, well, Jordan, here's their concern. From a restaurant standpoint, they think you're going to waste it. So until you drink that up, they're not going to give you any more. Now, once you finish, they'll give you a refill. But until you use what you have, you can't expect for any more. Now, I, I tell that story and I say it that way because here's what I found. One of the things that's kind of cliche in church is we're talking about growth and we're talking about God doing so much more in and through us. And that is the point. We're trying to get to a place of becoming disciplined disciples. But some of us are asking God to pour something into us and we have not effectively used what he's already given us. We're saying, God, give me more, give me more, give me more. And what is happening is the front is we're full, but nothing is overflowing. We're just stuck. A couple of weeks ago, let me set it up for you. Uh, uh, our, under our kitchen sink, I'm a great husband. Let me just throw that in there. Um, and so what I would do is I would buy my wife flowers a lot of times when I would go out of town. So consequently, we have a lot of vases. Va- we got more than one vase under the sink. And, and so all these more than one vase is under there. And what was happening is the water from under the pipe for some weird reason started leaking. And it started to fill up all these various vases. And the water sat there for so long, we didn't know. But all of a sudden, we started to have a smell, a little bit of an odor from up under the sink. You know, also all of our extra garbage bags known as Walmart bags were all becoming soaked and, and everything. And when we looked under there, all of this standing water was starting to turn colors and it was starting to smell. See, some of us, hear me, we want God to pour something into us, but we've held on to what he gave us at the beginning. It's begun to stink. It's stale. See, God says rivers of living water will flow through us. Rivers have somewhere to go. But a sea is stagnant. And unfortunately, some of us are asking God for more. And we haven't used what he's given us in the first place. See, what I know is this. God will not put into you what he cannot get out of you. See, see, see God, God, God is not pouring into you. God pours through you. And if what God puts into you, no one else can experience, then God has to say, you're already full. Why would I waste giving you something more? See, it's, it's one of these things that we have to understand that there is 
this idea of becoming a disciple. That's the goal. Not a church member, not someone who said a prayer, but an actual disciple. And there's more to the Christian life than just saying a prayer. In fact, in Ephesians, it says it this way, may you experience the love of Christ, though he is too great to understand fully, catch this, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. If I have to be made complete, then it is completely possible to function incomplete. See, some of us, notice the pronoun I use, us. We have to understand that the fullness of God is only experienced through a life of surrender. And so what God puts in me, God gets to say what goes through me. See, if we don't have a surrendered life, the truth is we can just live a hindered life. We just want to get to heaven. Hallelujah. But what God is calling us to is action. See, what God says is, I I have a will for your life. I want to do something with your life. I didn't just save you for getting saved. I have a purpose, and I don't care how old you are, how young you are, whatever. My purpose is to be fulfilled through you. See, the Bible says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Learn God's will. And God's will is rooted in obedience. And it's about being a disciple. Catch this definition. True discipleship is an eternal learning and growth project rooted in obedience to God and his will. Discipleship is not a six-week class. Discipleship is not something you just read online. It's a daily lifestyle of growth. You can never graduate from discipleship. There's no master class because there's always another level. I mean, you can graduate. You're going to have to die. Hallelujah. But as long as you are on this earth, there's always more. This is why I love this story, this text in 2 Kings. And when when it dropped into me, it's it's weird sometimes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to preach this. And and the worship team will tell you, like, I get up that morning and be like, okay, I'm changing everything. And God starts to show you something completely different. But the story says there's this woman. She's a widow. She has two sons. And apparently her husband died and left her with some debt. Now, notice what she says. She goes to Elisha and she says, let me tell you about my husband. He died. Now, these creditors are showing up. But she also mentioned, she said, he served you and he served the Lord. But he's dead. I don't know if y'all noticed this because I don't know how old this man was. I don't know. Did he did he die like a, a, a chariot running? Mo- we do not know. What we do know is he's no longer breathing. And what we do know is that while he was breathing, he still served the Lord. Now, sometimes, can we be honest? Can we, can we talk real? Let's just have an honest conversation. You at home, come on, talk back to me. Y'all know how it is. Uh, sometimes we be like, if you serve the Lord, this should be the outcome. If you serve the Lord, you shouldn't get sick. If you serve the Lord, all your bills should be paid. If you serve the Lord, everything should be glorious. I don't know about you, but I just found out that ain't true. And what I loved about this is even though in her distress, she didn't say, well, he served the Lord and he dead. No, no, she still saw the goodness that can come from going to the man of God. She still said, God is powerful despite my circumstances or what he or I have experienced. God still has the possibility and the ability to be faithful. But here's where it gets weird for me. Just let me just tell you this. She goes, and the prophet says, what do you have in your house? She's like, I ain't got nothing. Just got some little oil. And she's like, I can't even have a fish fry with this. This ain't enough to do nothing with. 
And he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and ask your neighbors and your friends for some pots. Now, I don't know about you, but this is where he kind of lost me. I don't want everybody in my business. Like, like, why am I going to go ask them? Because you know somebody was like, you asking to borrow a pot. You need to be asking to borrow a dollar. What is wrong with you? And so looking at her, she's like, uh, can, can, I get, can I get a pot? Can I get a pan? Can I get a pitcher? Can I get a jug? Can I get something? And I'm like, ooh, I, I don't know if I want to do that. Now, now, we know how the story ends, but let, let, let's, have a, let's play along with this for a second. What, hap- what would happen, though, if she said she went to the prophet and the prophet said, hey, go and ask your neighbors and your friends for a pot. And she said, mm, amen. And she went home and sat down. You would look at her like she was crazy. True or false? Like she didn't hear what she need to do and she don't do it. Sounds kind of asinine, don't it? Or does it? Because many of us hear sermons on what we need to do. Oh, we know that God wants us to forgive. We know that God wants us to walk in love. We, won't know, we know that God wants us to get out of that bad relationship. And we can say, preach, preacher, hallelujah, amen, and don't do nothing different. So as crazy as this person is, we will look at her like, what's wrong with you? You got direction. I have to look in the mirror sometime and say, Trey, what's wrong with you? You got direction. See, sometimes I've learned that obedience is, no, let me rephrase that. Obedience is always inconvenient. Obedience is not easy. It is a whole lot easier to hear a sermon. It is a whole lot easier to hear correction. It's a whole lot different than to put it into play. God said it, or Jesus said it this way, even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Be ye not just hearers of the word, but doers. Even if it may make you feel a little uncomfortable, even if it don't like, like I said, God, you, he could have done it another way. He could have said she go fill up her sink. But no, no, no. Obedience is what gives us the breakthrough. See, here's the thing. We can hear a whole lot of stuff and sometimes we get confused and we assume that growth in church is about getting more information about God. I know about God. I read about God all that type of stuff. Can I help you out? The devil knows about God. The devil even knows scripture. And it has done him no good. In fact, the Bible even says that the demons know who Jesus is and they tremble at his name. But if we do not put it into practice, it does us no good. Hear me. The goal of all of our growth is not information, it's transformation. If we do not do something different, all we have done is heard a good thing. See, it's it's not optional. It's the requirement. Y'all have all heard the scripture. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But we sometimes think, well, I can can do what I want. I'm okay and I'm okay and, and God got me. Ooh, grace. We love grace. Love grace. But here's what I want. You understand, do not confuse God's unconditional love with his unconditional approval. They're not the same. Yes, God loves you regardless, but he still has his rules. You love your children regardless, but you still correct them when they're wrong. You will be a negligent parent just to be like, oh, well, my love says you can go ahead and play with that knife, two-year-old. That's foolishness. And when God sees disaster coming our way, he will cause us to adjust. Here's what I love about it, though. He says, go to your neighbors and, and ask them for a jar. You notice he didn't say what kind of jar? Just any old jar. What was the only requirement of the jar? That the jar be empty. That's it. As long as the jar is empty, 
The jar is available. I see, see, here, here's the thing. We, we want the prettiest pictures. We want the nicest jar. We're like, ooh, that jar dingy on the outside. How is it on the inside? No matter what it is, can it be used for God's purpose? See, it's one of the things that no matter what we can talk about, obedience and discomfort. See, the peace of God is not defined by the comfort of the world. And so oftentimes when it comes to following God, it's going to feel a little bit uneasy. Scripture says the Holy Spirit is our comforter, but it didn't say he's going to make you comfortable. Very different. And after she does all of this, it says she says, go home, close the door. The miracle happened in the privacy of her home. Nobody saw it. They were, what's she doing with them pots? You're like, God, come on, make me look good. No, no, no. I got to trust God to be by myself and see the miracle happen there. But what I want to point out this is the scripture says that when there were no more jugs to pour in, the oil stopped. When there was nowhere else to pour the oil, it stopped. Now, I know we, that's where the story ends. In fact, it goes to another story after that, and Elisha does an amazing thing. But can I point something out to you? The miracle was the expansion of the oil in the house, but there's no value in the oil till it left the house. God filled the jar in the house, good. But until the oil leaves the container, her life isn't changed. See, we can get stuck on the miracle and say, fill me up. But where does it go once it's full? See, that's where our breakthrough happens. It's not holding the oil in the house. She could have stayed in there for weeks. Oh, I got a bunch of oil. And guess what? Her sons would be in slavery. But her breakthrough came in sending the oil somewhere else. See, when I hear the scripture says that the oil stopped because there was nowhere else to pour, that's good for this story, but I find it troubling for the church. See, we can always say, God has not given us no more. We need fresh anointing and all of that. Have we been so cavalier that we already full and God said, there's nowhere for it to go, so it stopped. Yeah, we want God to do more, but what have we done with what's already on the inside of us? Have we become vases instead of pitchers that can see the oil go somewhere else and it be making a difference outside the house? I want to set it up like this. Can y'all go ahead and come up, grab your pictures real quick? I, I, got a, I had an idea and, and, I, and I thought about something. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm a preacher and, and so right here I have my pitcher of water it's nice ain't it it's glass look at it ting ting cost a little bit this, this, is, this is a good picture right here but behind me I have three other individuals I have Miss Wilma I have Miss Sheila I have my man Jit now, I don't know if you can see this. You, you at home, I don't know how you can tell this, but mine is glass. In fact, mine cost a little bit more. Theirs is plastic. It's the cheap stuff. But I want to point something out to you because you can look at my glass and assume that my glass is more special and it's more valuable. Can I point something out to you? When I look at someone like a Miss Wilma, Miss Wilma don't like for us to brag on her, so I'm going to keep it short in that this is one of the most awesome women I've ever met. A lot of the things that we see happen in this church do not happen without her commitment. Yes, yeah, she's behind the scenes and she's making things happen, but she prayed. This woman can pray right here. And she's a difference maker. I look at someone like Sheila 
Sheila, y'all think, oh, she's just head of hospitality. Oh, yeah, they just greeting and saying, hey, we glad to see you. No, 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 no. God has uniquely gifted Sheila to be the warmest person I've probably ever met. And so if you never hear my sermon, you're going to experience God just because of this woman right here. Then I look at my man, Jit. That's my dude. This guy right here has been, and I wasn't going to say this, you've been one of the biggest blessings to me. See, if you don't know about Jit, Jit got a pass. Jit got a crazy pass. But now his past has become his platform and it's his testimony. We can talk about baptisms around here, but I don't know if you're aware the number of people who've not only come to Bethel, but who have come to Jesus because of this man right here. (laughs) Baptism, after baptism, his name comes up. Like if you saw a tree, it would be a sequoia with branches stretching as far as you can see because of the difference he's made. But you say, oh, he got plastic. Pastor Trey's on the platform. Pastor Trey doing the preaching. Hear me. Purpose has nothing to do with a platform or a position. If I were to look at the world right now and I say it's empty, here's mine. All right? Got everything you give me, I'm going to give. If I gave everything I had, it's not going to make a difference. If I give all that I have, it's not going to make a difference because you got caught up on the glass, they got plastic. But do you see the amount of difference they can make in them? Do you see the volume that they can make? See, we think this is quality. No, 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 no. These people have fruit. And if I were to say to them, come here, y'all listen, this is our task as a church. We want to win as many people in this empty world. And I'm all tapped out. But Jit, come here. Sheila, come here. Miss Wilma, come here. What God has put in you, can he trust you to pour it out? And look at this. An empty world begins to look a little bit differently and begins to fill up with the love of Christ. No, no, no. Not just what God has in them, but their willingness to pour it out. But, but, but we're not done yet. See, when we talk about growth, growth is not just information. Growth is about capacity. Growth says, I can start with a little measuring cup of faith. And then God says, you know what? You've been faithful with that. Let me give you a little bit more. And the scripture talks about the, the folks with the talent. Some got five, some got 10, he gave one, one. And the one with the one did not use it. And do you know what Jesus said about him? He said, you're wicked. So his inability to use and grow what God had given him was not just okay. No, Jesus says, you're wicked. And so if you can take what little bit you have, this is what our church should start to look like. As God works through women of God, who've been through some things, but who know what God's about, who can trust what God is. I know your cup may not be as big as theirs, but he says, will you pour? 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 Now, hold on. Oh, no. My cup is empty. I don't have any more. My cup is empty. Here's what I know about God. See, we see God in the cup. But God said, no. Got a whole cart. And what begins to happen is if I will empty out, I have to go back to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I got to pray. I got to read my Bible and God says, hold up, hold up, hold up. You ready? You ready? Guess what? I'll fill you up so you can pour some more. And if I continue to pour, what happens is my connection with God, because I got to go back to him over and over to fill up. But let me show you what God does. You start with this cup. It's our nice Bethel Gold public cup. 
And God says, you've been faithful with this 10 ounce cup. I'm gonna give you 20 ounces. And the same thing I asked you to do with this cup, will you do with that cup? And God begins to hand off to everyone. And you say, God, keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring. God, you can trust me. You can trust me to empty myself. You can say whatever you put in me that I'm connected with you and God, you can have it all. Now, I know sometimes we think the world is too dangerous. It is too dark. The world is too empty. The world is too void. God is not asking you to change the world. He's asking to work through you to change the world. And what at one point seemed insurmountable, guess what? It looks a little bit different. It gets us a little bit different. But we have to continually be pouring. God wants to work through each and every one of you because you're uniquely gifted. You're uniquely talented. It's not about what you've done. It's about who God is on the inside of you. And if we're willing to sacrifice and say, God, you have your way. God, you do you. God said, I got to whole lot of supply. Hey, hey, you need a bottle? I'll refresh you. Hey, 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 hey. You know what? We should have put some fruit in this because God got that good, good water. And not only that, it's not just for you to pour, but it's also a means to refresh you. And what God is saying is I got to do so much more. See, if I were going to title this, thank you ladies, I would call it There Is More. And we tend to think of there is more means there is more blessings and there's more. And all of that is true. But Bethel, there is more work to do. There is a world who needs to encounter Jesus. And Jesus says, I'll pour out my goodness in you if I can get it through you. And then we begin to understand what God is doing on the inside of us. And we say, my life it's built on his love. My life is built on who he is. My life is that firm foundation that cannot be shaken. And we begin to say, not just lyrics and songs, but we begin to live in a way that goes out and forever changes the world. But the question is, if God were to put it in you, could he get it out of you? If God were to fill you up, would you just be a vase? Or are you willing to be a pitcher? Are you willing to say, God, it's yours. It's your way. Have your way. Have your way. You do you, God. And I'll give you all the praise and the glory. Even in this room, we're asking God to not just make us Christians, but to God take our life God to use us, God to be our designated driver in this crazy world where he leads and we follow. And can we say, God, I'll put my trust in you. God, I'll put my hope in you, not just for me, but so that you can do something outside of me. And we begin to declare, say, 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 say.
Wasn't that a great message? Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week for Easter. You can be with us online or if you've registered in person, have a great week.